Okay, uh, thanks everyone for coming. I'm going to call this meeting to order the Elm Street Planning Commission. It's set up 7 o'clock. Um, you want to call the roll, Judy? Yes, Reed. Here. Sims. Here. Stiles. Here. Pelzell. Here. Toby. Here. Also present uh, as an observer and as the alternate is Adam Abraham. All right, thanks. Also, sorry. Yeah. Our illustrious solicitor, Chris <laughs> Connor, is also present, as is Denise Swinger, the zoning administrator for the village. Okay, so we have an agenda here. Um, any changes or alterations? Any suggestions on that? If not, let's go to the review of the minutes here real quickly. Uh, beginning with the September 14th. Um, I think we already identified some things there, Judy. Tim was not here and Adam was voting. Uh, any changes on page one other than that? Change on page two, page three. Someone like to make a motion to approve those as uh, did amended? I move approval as amended. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Jerry abstains. Okay. Well, I to abstain as well. Oh, yeah, you don't care either. Okay, um, moving on then to the meeting minutes from October 12th. Uh, any modifications to page one? Page two. Page three. Um, Adam, you can chime in on this since uh, you were present at this meeting as an acting member. Um, all in favor? Need three votes. I'm sorry, did you have a motion? Oh, wait, we have a motion, sorry. I moved to seven minutes. Okay, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And I abstain. I have a And I abstain. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't think we have any communications other than uh, some of the um, deals associated with all these applicants, so we can go on. Um, you want to give a two-minute council report? Okay. <laughs> Wait, but things did go through council that we approved. Right, did we approve the, uh, you approved the uh, zoning code changes? Oh, testimony, yes. yeah. I don't think so. Well, they, they, they had a first reading, first reading, first reading okay, yeah. and at the next council meeting, uh, I would expect that the okay. amendments will be approved. Right. Yeah. There was one. Mm -hmm. no, What's that? We haven't had, no, we haven't had a reading? Okay, okay. well, there was a discussion, a first reading is coming up at the next council meeting. Okay. And there was one minor change, non-substantive, but changes of language. Okay. Okay, next item on our agenda is citizens' comments. This is a time when <coughs> anybody here has anything they would like to address planning commission about that is not otherwise on the agenda, because you'll have time at that point as well to uh, chime in, and that's on the two conditional uses. So is there anything else, anyone else? Anyone wants to uh, step forward and have a go with the microphone? If not, um, we can go to public hearings. And the first public hearing is for the conditional use for 740 Dayton Street, um, Arnold Adolph. Um, the way these hearings work is um, uh, we hear from staff, we hear from the applicant, then we open a public hearing, anyone has any comments? Then we close that public hearing, have any further discussion, and then um, if someone wants to make a resolution, then that's when that happens. So that's how it kind of plays out for everyone here. Um, so I guess to begin with, Denise, do you want to? Sure. Uh, Mr. Adolph, um, 740 Dayton Street, um, he contacted um, the zoning office regarding um, metering the uh, accessory structure separately from the principal dwelling. Um, and it was explained that that wasn't allowed for our new zoning code. Um, it was um, discovered in the conversation that he was actually changing the use from a garage to an accessory dwelling unit. So he completed the application and is here tonight seeking approval for the ADU. Okay. And I think based upon what you said, 
your recommendation at this point is to approve this, is that correct? Yes, with conditions. Right, yes. okay. Is Mr. Adolph here? Right here, sir. You want to uh, kind well, of give us a two minute uh, synopsis? Let of me see, the, the, um, the property is the historic property of um, Virginia Hamilton, Thanks, who grew Judy. up, thank you so much, who grew up in this town, and about um, eight, seven, eight years ago, I built a garage behind the house and built it um, to residential code without even thinking that it would ever be residential in an attempt to facilitate. Uh, it's a small house, how all those people lived there all those years, I don't know. But the house is being rented, a mother, a daughter, three children. The mother is a 75-year-old um, legally blind woman, and I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if I could take half that garage? I do not drive old New Yorker who still, who failed the test too many times, too many times to, to mention it. Um, at any rate, and so um, in my ignorance, I began work uh, without realizing um, the process. And so I'm, there, there have been no um, structural changes, um, all of the codes are being adhered to, AC has been doing all of the sewer and, and water um, uh, uh, connecting up and coming down uh, to the village. The upstairs will be only for um, storage. There's just uh, plywood all around and a single closet. Um, since I don't have a car, I'll be using the upstairs for a lot of the stuff that will come down the field from 750 Union Street, which is my address, which is 40 years worth of um, books and papers and manuscripts and all the stuff that we've accrued. <laughs> so everything is on the downs is everything that's residential is uh, is downstairs, and from my understanding, all of the um, um, requirements for residential are being adhered to. The square footage, uh, the kitchenette, the appliances, the bathroom, the plumbing, uh, the parking space. Uh, and it's my property. Uh, I am not going to ask for a, a separate number or a separate, um, uh, um, you know, not realizing that that just isn't the way things go, a, a separate meter. So I'm quite content to have that meter um, continue on, you know, as with the meter of the uh, rental. And uh, I think I've just about pretty much covered it. Thank you. Okay, well thanks for that. Um, anyone have any questions for Denise or Mr. Adolf? I guess um, I know that you need one off-street parking space. So I'm assuming that there is one off-street Absolutely, parking yes. Space. Right out in front of the cement pad, uh, what had been a, a garage. Thank you. And if I'm correct, there, there is parking on the right hand all the way up to Baker Street. Oh, yeah, on both, on both okay. sides of Baker Street. And, the, uh, and the, uh, the family that rents 740 Dayton Street parks their car in front of the, uh, the building on, you know, on 740 Dayton. Okay. Any other questions? If there is not, then we'll go ahead and open the public hearing. So if anyone wants to comment on this um, application for conditional use, um, step up to the microphone and identify yourself so that the folks on Channel 5 know who you are. And um, if we can kind of keep it to a couple of minutes, because like, we got a lot of people here, so I'm sure at some point someone's gonna have some comments. So um, let's try to uh, try to keep things brief. And, uh, um, and with that, I guess I'll open the public hearing. Uh, does anyone want to add anything with respect to this application? All right, well, that's easy enough. Um, then I'll close the public hearing. Uh, do we have, uh, any more discussion than we need to have up here? 
Well, just, I guess, since um, only the downstairs will be used, it sounded like that the uh, square footage meets um, the standard, that it is 50% or less of the house square footage. Right. Excuse me, it comes in under the $750, seven hundred fifty dollars um, square feet. Um, can you go over the recommendation that staff has? Well, the only recommendation that <coughs> I had was to approve it and that um, with the conditions that <coughs> the finished upstairs of the ADU shall not be used as a living space, he, he, you know, for any future owners as well. Um, that uh, I'm suggesting that a door be installed either at the top of the stairs or perhaps at the bottom of the stairs. I showed the stairwell um, sh separating the storage area from the uh, main living area. <coughs> and everything else is, you know, no more than two adults. Uh, that's all stuff that's already in the requirement for an accessory dwelling unit. Right, right. Okay. <coughs> Does someone like to make a resolution or propose a motion here to uh, accept this? Oh, I move that. Sure. I move that we accept the application for seven foot of the food speed. Agenda is the conditional use for home occupation at 120 Walnut Street. Um, we have a memo from the solicitor and um, talking about what we are able to do and not able to do um, based upon the law of Ohio. And uh, so I hopefully we all read that. Um, and then Denise, uh, would you like to start again? Sure. Uh, um, Nora Burns, who lives at 128 <coughs> South Walnut Street, had written to the village manager uh, requesting approval to begin <coughs> serving breakfast in her home again. Um, after conferring with the village's legal counsel, we found she could apply <coughs> under our zoning code for what we call a home occupation permit. And there's some specific requirements um, under section 1260208 of the code relating to that, um, and she is here tonight to discuss that in more detail. Um, okay, and uh, do you want to... Uh, do you want to kind of um, uh, summarize um, your findings at this point, Denise, once you have a chance to? Um, I went uh, and visited her um, at her home and took some photos of the rooms that she's using. <coughs> the uh, square footage exceeds the uh, square footage allowed, um, but I don't know if all of the rooms are completely dedicated to the operation. Um, so that's something we need to discuss a little bit more. And there, and there was some question as to whether the kitchen is really considered to be a designated part of that uh, operation as well. Um, pretty much that was the the parking issue. Um, there really isn't any, she doesn't have a driveway in the front, um, so the only parking that is available is on South Walnut Street, and that's always um, a very busy, uh, high traffic area. 
So um, I had suggested she seek something in writing. She had had a couple of business owners that had offered their lots, which I see today. She did turn that in. Um, so she has um, received approval from Tom's Market and the Corner Code for any uh, vehicle traffic. The only other <coughs> issue is uh, the number of people, and that's open for discussion too. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, Nora, oops. oh, here you are. Um, you want to add anything to uh, what Denise is? Um, well, I guess the most. Uh, not bring in that. <laughs> I've got a loud voice. No, um, for the for the television. It's part of TV. <laughs> um, it's just that I like to do this. So. Um, I think it's essential at the same time that we talk about logistics and the regulations and the possible negative impact on the street or the neighborhood, it's essential that at the same time we talk about the benefits to the community. Um, and I can speak to that. I open my doors to serve breakfast enough times that I saw this incredible phenomenon happening, which was that lots of people came in and lots of people sat down and eat, ate together. and laughed and talked and shared stories and shared their lives and debated issues and made connections and barriers were broken down. And that's a phenomenon that everyone here knows happened. Um, but there are two features to my particular venue that are different, that made it unique. We all know that food is a great equalizer and you know people are transformed by sitting down and eating together. But in this particular venue, it was a true cross-section of the community. It was everyone. Rich and poor, young and old, you know, retirees, families, high school students, all colors, all personalities. So that's one, you know, feature I challenge you to find any spot in town that's that diverse. Um, and the other thing that I think is important to mention is the serendipitous nature of it. You didn't know who you were going to come in and sit down with, who you were going to get to know. Um, what what you hear, what you learn, what friends you make. And in this particular community, when we talk endlessly about diversity and inclusiveness and affordability and community building, this spot was all of that. All of it. Which is pretty powerful. Should I ask them now, or do you want me to wait? I just address them now. Okay. Well, I'll start with the parking issue. Reading what are because I because I think what's we have different issues that come to us, and we have to look at you know what is written and be fair to everybody, and that we're looking at the same thing for everyone. So on this one, parking number L, it talks about shall be provided for on the lot's driveway which shall meet the minimum size requirements for off-street parking set forth in Chapter 1264. Okay, so we have, what I understand, there is not a driveway or parking, is that right, Nora? So we have two local businesses that have said, 
they have parking there. Can you, I mean, I don't see anything in here that says you can substitute that. Can you substitute parking? And maybe our attorney or staff can tell us if that's something that's. Well, I, I think that, that would be considered an aspect of, of the area that's, that the house is in. I mean, Yellow Springs has a lot of unique properties that have been built over the years. And uh, my understanding of that, where the parking lots are, I think that the Planning Commission could properly consider her location to that, okay. what I'll call publicly available parking. Okay. If they write at the Tom's as a private lot. Okay. Even though we all use it as a public And we want to make, one, might want to add, for purposes of completing the record uh, before the, the Planning Commission, the, the, the two letters, I think they were referenced, but we yeah. want to formally make that part of the, the record that, uh, where they are, that uh, uh, Bob Swaney has indicated that uh, he doesn't have an issue with uh, his parking lot being used as well as uh, Tom Gray and uh, the use of his parking lot. And those letters were submitted to the Planning Commission. Is a specific number of spaces required for the home of the city? Well, according to the factors, uh, it, it, and that would be in 1262, I believe, 08E5L, um, uh, parking of motor vehicles shall be limited to one vehicle used for the home occupation per parcel. Parking generated by the conduct of the home occupation shall be provided for on the lot's driveway, which route shall meet the minimum size requirements for off-street uh, parking set forth in Chapter 1264. Um, again, my understanding is there is no driveway. Is there right. any? Well, the, the, it, it appears that the village, because I went out and looked, there was space for a driveway, but it appears that the since the curb was never cut, the village made uh, another parking space. So that precludes her from having off street parking. Well, I, I, unless you would go back and ask for that. Because I, as I looked today, that space was open, and if you wanted to, to be hard over, she, she could knock the curb down, put some gravel in, and buy a parking space. I'll say this, I think that the, that the issue of the parking comes down to the discretion of this board, of this commission, on how it wants to view the application. And factor in the letters that have been submitted and the fact that there is private but publicly available parking. Okay. Okay, well then, then there is the number of people coming. Mm -hmm. um, and there's actually, it looks like maybe one part under A, home occupation, it talks about uh, the proposed occupation will not employ any persons other than residents, and it will not generate customers, clients, or visitors to the home. Um, and then I guess in another part, we, it has about eight people coming per day, 40 per week. And Although I understand that the is that the state of Ohio allows 115 meals a week. Or 40. Yes, or 40. I thought that's what I said. Yeah. Um, but that our our code is really what. Um, yeah. It and, supersedes. And so in her application, she is saying that she may serve up to 115. Yet our code says. Our regulations say no more than 40 a week, eight visitors a day, or 40 a week. Right. So there, is, so there's an issue right there. Um, another thing that I saw is that under D, home occupation, it talks about the use shall be carried on only by the residents of the dwelling, and no more than one other person. And in her application, she said there may be two to three other volunteers that would help. So that is over the number it talks about there. And then we talked about the space issue, that it's no more than 20% of the usable space. 
or 250 square feet, whichever is less. Um, and what she had in her application it, it is significantly more than that right. space. And then the other thing, that's it. The, the other thing, and I don't know if she addressed it, I have heard this comment that um, under J, it talks about traffic generated, that you can't have um, deliveries made by any vehicles larger than a utility vehicle. And I heard that Gordon Food stops and makes deliveries. So that would be something that would not be permitted. And maybe that's you know not true, but uh, you can't have these uh, commercial vehicles. Can I address a couple of these questions? Sure. sure. Wait, um, wait, we need to hear you. <laughs> The Gordon food truck delivered what I did this five days a week. It isn't going to happen again. I'm so not at all. One day a week. And uh, in terms of the numbers served, I I understand the discrepancy that Yellow Springs zoning for home occupation says 40 clients a week, which if I were a massage therapist would make a lot of sense. Um, I'm only asking to operate one day a week. And if I'm limited to 40, it means I'm put in a position where I'm turning people away. And it, it, that's contrary to the spirit of what I'm doing. And so I'm not sure whether I need to then apply for a zoning variance so that I can stick to the Ohio Revised Code number of 115 a week. I, you know, I don't know. You'll have to tell me what, what would happen. But I'm not... I'm not comfortable with with the 40. It, it would mean that at night in the morning I close my doors and you know the people who had planned on coming at 10 can't come. Um, anyway, so that's just, those are just the two things I wanted to mention about those issues. Okay, thanks. You know on the space thing, if you say well it's one day a week and the total aggregate Amount you can say well, it's less than 20%, right? In terms of total usage for the week. Really? I mean, I don't know. I mean, you can interpret it that way, right? Um, so that might go away. You might go, yes. but if she were serving fewer people and didn't use as many rooms, then it would fall within probably the 20%. Oh, that too. But but if she were serving the 115, then it will be probably the largest space. And you know, the problem we have with this, and the reason the code is written like it's written, is because this is written for all residential students and B and A. So if if um, you say one person can do it, then maybe someone on our circle could do the same thing. Um, and um, and you establish precedent, and so it makes it kind of a, a sticky wicket for us, because I know, I mean, these people are not here to oppose this. <laughs> um, the, um, at the same time, though, we have to think of the village as a whole in terms of how this, you know, establishing precedent can, and, and how is that going to ripple through someone else's um, effort to do something uh, in a similar manner elsewhere. So um, maybe everyone else understands this, but um, I'd like the lawyer to our, our lawyer to um, explain what you know what. I guess the business part of this, like what makes something a business and what makes it not a business, like I, the part of this that is 115 people coming to your house over the course of a week and eating and 150 people, you know, not allowed to. What's the difference here? Well, I'll start with this. As a general rule, if uh, one is going to serve meals uh, to a group of people, and while this is, I understand it, a voluntarily voluntary donation model, um, but the service of meals to third parties where there is going to be some form of compensation, the general rule is that it would be licensed by the state, that there would have to be a license for a food service uh, permit. Um, but there is an exception in state law that says that uh, if one serves less than 115 meals per week, that that 
permit is not required. So clearly the request, as I understand it from discussions with the county, that the county has interpreted the state code to say that a license is not required. Now, when it comes to governance of the local standards, the village, like many communities, have what's called home rule authority, which is, as a municipality, our community, the community is entitled to set standards as long as they don't interfere with the state standards. So, for example, a few years ago, the village took a stand on anti-fracking. That ordinance is arguably in violation of the home rule authority that we have because the state had legislated upon that. So in the context of food service, the state has carved out an area that says if you're going to engage in the business of food service, then a license is required. But we have an exception. The next question is, can the village legitimately restrict the number of people that are served in the context of a home occupation? The answer to that question is yes. If you have any questions about that, there were copies of the memo that was provided to the planning commission. And the reason is that falls within our home rule authority because we're not requiring a permit. It's just based upon what I'll call the community standard as reflected in the zoning code. That is a permissible exercise of authority. Does that answer the question? I guess, like, what – maybe this is, like, a more broader question about our code and what, you know, like, does – what – I feel like there might be other uses that are not necessarily food-based that one might go about doing that wouldn't sort of activate the occupational permit, you know, the home occupation clause. I don't – I guess I'm wondering what about this activated the clause if it didn't activate it for the state. Okay, and that's a good question. That – what – I interpret your question to be you're asking what's the definition of a home occupation. And under the law, when one interprets a statute or a code section, one relies typically on the plain meaning of that word or phrase. And when looking at the Yellow Springs Code, it defines itself. The word occupation defines itself. So I think that you have to go to an outside source to determine what the word occupation means. And a commonly used source would be to go to any dictionary. And the definition that I found in other sources confirmed this was the Merriam-Webster's online dictionary, which defines occupation as one of the definitions, any activity that a person spends time doing. And then it goes on to say a full – Excuse me. A full definition of occupation is an activity in which one engages. For example, pursuing pleasure has been one's major occupation. Vocation is also defined within the definition of occupation. So I think as I understand this application and recognizing that certainly this request falls within the spirit of what this village stands for. And because I think that we look at the definition of occupation or profession and we assume automatically that it must require a compensation, monetary compensation, to be qualified as that. And that's not the standard. And so for that reason, I concluded that vocation, profession, occupation are in the context of this code section synonymous, and that's why the home occupation section would apply to this permit. Does that answer your question? Yes. I think so, yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. I think the other part of the question, if I heard it correctly, was what activated our code, zoning code, to come into play. And it seems like to me is once the request was higher than 40 visits per week, the request to have a larger, that activated our zoning code. 
I think that w what activated is, is that the, look, if we take a step back, when one, the analysis started, the first question really came down to was the license required? I think that a couple years ago when this issue was, first came up, that was, that was an issue. But when one looks at the zoning code and says, okay, what does this activity fall under? It would fall under the definition of home occupation. Therefore, in my view, that's what triggered the application of the code. But we've done no, it, it is defined in the code. I don't have my copy with me, but Denise, you may have it in there, but home occupation is defined. Yeah. Um, Did you want me to read the whole paragraph? I, I, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. The proposed, um, well, I mean, the, the, the permitting process. I'm looking at whether or not. Um, in the permitting process, the proposed home occupation uh, will not employ any persons other than residents of the dwelling. The home occupation is such that it will not generate customers, clients, or visitors to the home. There will be no sign on the property identifying the home occupation, and all other provisions of this section shall be met. I think um, so. If she came, if she came to get a permit for a food service operation in her home, strictly under that, there is nothing in our code that would allow that. I mean, it's not permitted to have a restaurant or any type of food operation in a home. The only way that we were able to even consider this was through the home occupation because the home occupation is more defined by <coughs> the impact. Uh, Not the use. Yes. Well, and, and let me let me answer my, my own question here, which is uh, section 1284.05, which is a definitional section in the Yellow Spring Zoning Code, um, defines home occupation. An occupation or profession conducted as an accessory use in a dwelling or a detached accessory building on the same lot as, the principal dwell as a principal dwelling by a member or members of the resident family, which is clearly accessory and incidental to the residential use of the lot, also referred to as a home-based business. So that was the reason why when I looked at the beginning, an occupation or profession conducted, well, what do occupation and profession mean? And that led to going to an outside source to determine what the plain meaning of that code section could be interpreted to mean. Thanks. Any other questions for Nora or staff? Okay. If there aren't, then I'll open the public hearing. As before, um, you can identify yourself. Uh, we have not turned the clock on, the two minute clock, uh, but uh, if you could please be brief because uh, we want to uh, uh, make sure everyone has a chance to uh, um, have a say. Um, at the same time, we don't want to be here until, uh, until midnight. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yes. And, and, and what, yeah, one more thing. Um, and if you feel like you want to add something, like, have you already had a chance? Let's make sure everybody has a chance to go first, and then we'll see where we are. Uh, uh, if you want the timer kept, <coughs> we can just use the iPhone. So you can go two, three, two or three minutes. Okay, let's do that. Two, three. Let's go two. Okay. My name is Suzanne Oldham, and I ran the Arthur Morgan House Bed and Breakfast for 10 years. That is a home-based business. It is regulated by the same rules that you're talking about, the state rules of maximum number of meals is 115 meals. I lived there, it was a home-based business. How is Nora's really that essentially different? My understanding is that the bed and breakfast code, which has recently been instituted in the zoning code, it, it's a recent institution. I mean, it was, it was uh, composed, I don't know, I guess about a year and a half or two years ago. It was put into action just before I sold the place. So um, that defines a bed and breakfast regulation in the village differently from other home-based businesses, I guess. But when I started, my understanding was that what I did was, so long as it was according to the state rules, it was fine by the village. 
115 meals a week. And a lot more of the business was, a lot more of my house was devoted to my business than 20%, of course. I don't know how that, how that is an exception. I mean, I'm, I, oh, I'm, I'm asking you, I guess. Thank you. Yeah, I think there's just a different set of regulations with respect to the the uh, overnight uh, stay and that kind of thing. So would it be appropriate to consider yeah, those you requests for more? The new rules. Right. I mean, you didn't have to retroactively go back and abide by the new rules, did you? I was told I did, although... Because you should have been grandfathered in. Well, nobody came and told me I had to obey the rules, so I guess I was going to grandfathered in, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was a little scared for a little while there. Uh -huh. But, yeah, no, it, 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 the, the rules are not that different, so there wasn't that much change. Okay. Okay. Um, next. My name's Tim Courier. I do not, and am not, a resident of uh, Hill Springs. I live in Xenia. So can I still talk? <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things, uh, I've been a, a long time fan of Nora's and ate many a meal in her house and met a lot of interesting people, including a troubadour, which I said I was the thought I was in a time warp, but the guy worked. Um, October fat or uh, Renaissance. Renaissance. Renaissance, he went around. So it was interesting. But at any rate, um, from an outsider's point of view, looking at Yellow Springs, um, I've always seen it as a very progressive, cool, locally together community, trying to be unique and find its niche, which it already has, but ever evolving. And I thought this was a, a great experience for me, for the people I met, and uh, if there's any way to make this happen, I, I think it's a feather in your cap. Thank you. Thanks. My name is my name is Erin George. I work at the college. I'm one of the mental health counselors there. And um, you had mentioned in particular, Mr. Reed, that. You were worried about the precedent that it could set. That you know, what if people in Omar's circle wanted to start serving breakfast? Hallelujah! Like, let's do it. You know, what yeah. a great precedent to set. Really, I mean, if every one of us opened our homes and started feeding each other, I mean, good lord, I can't think of anything better, truly. And so, if somebody in Omar's circle wanted to start the same thing, they could come and appeal to you guys in the same way that Nora is. You know, I, I really, being a mental health counselor, I have brought countless students to Nora's to get to know the village and, get, and to get to know what kind of people we are. Nora represents the very best of us and the people who come there. It, it's, it's such a great way to welcome people into our village and to say, this is who we are. We feed people, we talk to people, we're, we honor diversity. And so if, if we're worried about setting a precedent, I can't think of a better one to set. Thank you. My name is Anissa Klein, and I also live in the village. I grew up here and moved away and came back. And, oh, okay, um, I'm going to talk about my daughter when she was a baby. I always cry when I do that, so just important. Um, I went to Nora's when it was in town, and then again when it reopened. And when it reopened, I was pregnant, and I was really sick. Because I couldn't eat almost anything, but I could eat food there, and I went every week for the last three months of my pregnancy, and then after I had my daughter, I brought her every single week, and she grew up there for the first year and a half, or well, two years of her life, and that was, you know, she was 14 months old, and I said, Haley, do you know what we're gonna do this morning? And she go. Nora! <laughs> and she met all these amazing people there, older people who just, you know, adored her. And um, she learned how to sit in a restaurant and, you know, have some foreign manners. Um, and it, two, the two most important things that it gave me, one was that especially my first year as a mom, 
that winter was incredibly cold and I wasn't back at work yet and I was incredibly isolated. But every Tuesday we had somewhere to go where I would like get to talk to adults and somebody else would play with my baby for a little bit and I didn't have to worry about who was gonna make me breakfast because somebody else was doing it. And like when you have a five month old and it's you know negative five degrees outside, having that is is huge. It, it did a lot in terms of um, minimizing my feelings of isolation and a feeling like I belonged somewhere and like for my mental health for sure. Um, and the other thing that Noor mentioned is that it's you know available to anybody financially. I'm a graduate student and an adjunct. My husband is, runs his own very small building business. Our funds are limited and I don't get to go out to restaurants. I don't have that kind of money ever really and so like going somewhere where, sorry Laura, I don't pay you very much. <laughs> I just have to go out and say it. But, um, but you know, somewhere that I could go where I don't, I don't have to cook. And um, I get, you know, they taken care of a little bit. Um, that's also huge, Why so it means a lot. Thank you. Thanks. That's what that song is. It wasn't an errant cell phone. <laughs> My name is Mark Munger. I moved here from Southern Nevada about 10 years ago or so. Wonderful place to be. Cold in the winter time. <laughs> and I want to expand on what that young lady just said. You slept in your car Monday night in the middle of January. You haven't had a meal in about four days. And you wake up Tuesday morning and you are just about to die. And you can't go to a restaurant because you don't have price for a cup of coffee. So you go see her and she'll feed you, and she'll tell you to come back next week. I do it again. Uh, my name is Walter Rhodes, big wide desk here. You people look good up there. I feel like I'm at a Senate hearing nothing much. <laughs> Uh, I've been in Yellow Springs about 28 years. I hang around the street down here. I could have run for mayor in about the second or third year and beat Mayor Fulbert right out of the woodwork, but I like the guy and I allowed him to run all these other years. Uh, this is an event, Nora's uh, breakfast there. It's just a community event that is warm and benign and benevolent. And I want to uh, relieve your mind about certain things. The parking problem is just not there. It's off the table. Uh, here's the reason. At that time of day, think of time now, 7 to 10 or thereabouts, there are no cars in the area, not even in Tom's lot, but he's already granted the parking spaces anyway. Uh, King's Yard is empty. People park down by the church. They walk there. I mean, not everyone just drives up to the door. So I don't think you need to allow that to worry you. I've never known of any blocking of large trucks or anything to go on like that. I think the parking is certainly not an issue uh, at all. Um, uh, and, and as I say, the, the warmth of the people, the variety of people that come and go, and people from out of town, you've already had one gentleman here, and they admire the village for being able uh, to access this type of place. It's what they expect of us. We define ourselves that way, and we should live up to our definition sometime. Uh, Jerry, congratulations on getting back on the council now, because uh, you know, that doesn't look good over there. They're going to raise my utilities 30%. Did you read that, uh, Jerry? Stop that. Don't let them do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the brewery just put in five new vats. So think of the water they use. Oh, boy. I don't think they're going to be happy over there. But listen, uh, I, I just uh, pulling for Nora to get this going again. She was a great success before in her house. A tremendous success out at the Hill Road the end. And you know what happened out there and why she's not there now. But uh, I, I don't think you'd have to bend over too far, backward or forward, to oh. move this through. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, next. My name is Mary Ann Britton. I am a single senior in Little Springs. And I look forward to eating at Nora's because it's the only time that I have somebody to eat. And I've talked to people from all over the world who come to know us. And I've had guests who have heard about Nora's and come and stay and say, take me to Nora's. <laughs> so I hope that you will pass this. It's important. Thanks. Hi, 
I'm Scott Stolzenberg, I'm a resident here in Yellow Springs. And my wife and I moved here about four years ago. I've always been fond of bed and breakfast because you just can't go to a restaurant and sit down with strangers and start a conversation. It's rather rude. So I like bed and breakfast because I loved going and meeting new people. And when my wife and I found this place, it allowed us as new people in town to very quickly make wonderful friends. There's many people in this room that we met at Nora's and became good friends with. And then through their friends, just kind of expanded into the community. And it's just a very welcoming thing. And it really helped us to settle into the community when we got here. I just think it's a wonderful service. And, and again, it doesn't matter where you are, your income level, or what's going on. You can still go out there, and meet everyone, see your old friends, make new ones. And I just think it's a wonderful asset to the community. However, you find a way, if you can make this happen. Thank Thanks. you. My name's Patty Dallas. <laughs> uh, the other day I was thinking about community. <laughs> it's not very emotional. <laughs> anyway, that there's like the hardware of community, the structure, the laws, the, um, the rules, the physical setup. And then there's the software, which is people connecting with each other. And, you know, it's good to have the hardware. You don't want to just have total pandemonium, but you also need the software. And Nora's was all about that. And I just feel like if there's any way that you can make it possible, then you should. Thanks. Can I just ask a question? A show of hands. Is there anyone here? Is everyone here to support this application? Absolutely. You got it. <laughs> Two hands. Okay. So if you don't feel like you want to come up and say anything, so noted. But um, Mike's still open. So anyone wants to come up and uh, and add to the uh, conversation? Just one sentence more. <laughs> we go to restaurants with the people that we know, and we sit down in church with the people that we know. And we don't have enough opportunities to sit down with people that we don't know. That's community building, meeting strangers. Anyway, thanks. Janet Murray. Um, I just wanted to just make a few comments. Some of them are inappropriate, but I'm going to make them anyway. <laughs> the um, parking situation, in terms of a precedent being set. It seems to me this, because of the location of Nora's house and, and what uh, Mr. Conrad said about how he thinks it fits in with public and private parking, I think you don't have to worry about that as a precedent because of this, as opposed to Omar Circle where it might be kind of irritating for the residents of Omar Circle to have 40 cars to send on them. Um, the code for home occupations seems to me kind of mean. Um, why on earth would you not want someone to be allowed to employ another person in your home occupation and and give a, you know a living to somebody else? I, I don't understand what that's why that aspect is in there. It seems. Um, contradictory to me to, you know, supporting ourselves. Um, and, I'm, and I don't quite understand. Um, I'm Nora's sister, so I know that when she opens up her house for breakfast by noon, she's back living in her house. So the percentage of the house that's being used for the home business in that time is only for a few hours. You know, it's not like 
it's, she, you know, she's back living in the house and, and everybody else who happens to come and go at that time, just like anybody else's house. So it's not solely um, set aside to be business. That's all. Yes. Oh, and the other thing is, no one has mentioned this, but the food's really good. <laughs> your question, the old code said you couldn't have any business. And this was just a start to try to make, it, encourage small businesses to kind of uh, have an opportunity for them to be be there. It, it may be that these be modified, and, and, and that's something that can happen for sure, uh, yeah. to allow one or five employees. So you're saying that all the massage therapists in this town and all the other people in town were simply breaking yeah. the law? Mm -hmm. That's crazy, but yes. They were bending. Or yes. Anyone else? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I have a couple questions I know. First of all, I, I did, you know, given the memo that uh, Chris gave us, it, it, it specifically, specifically says there is no mechanism for the planning commission to waive or vary this requirement of the Continental Village Code. Uh, which kind of says that we have to follow what's in the code. And, Make a recommendation and then send it to council. Correct. Or if it doesn't go to council, then again, that's the code. And to get it changed, people would then have to allow the council to change the code. Change the code. You know. And you know, I'm. You know, I heard it whatever everyone has said and so forth and it sounds like it's a great place to meet and so forth but from a sitting on the, the plane I don't have any other options well planning commission can recommend that's what we do we recommend things to council we could recommend a change a modification in the code. Well, and that's true. And and yet, on this application, yeah. I mean, this is where it ends, really. I, I, mean, I would it, like it, to, unless there's an appeal. I yeah. it seems. I mean, I don't. I don't understand why a bed and breakfast isn't the conditional use for a bed and breakfast isn't applicable here because that wasn't applied for. There's no bed for what. Is it required? I don't see anything requiring that bed and breakfast it has to have a bed. <laughs> <laughs>
more than residential use. Like, I really don't understand how feeding someone in your home is more than residential use, how that's a, I, I'm, I'm unconvinced by the occupation definition when there's no money being changed, you know, like, when there's, when it's not a business transaction. Well, I think that that's just part. I mean, that that's not part of the definition of occupation. I I mean, I haven't been convinced. I guess is what I'm saying. Well, it's, it is a business. How? Hey, whether she takes money or not, if she's serving people, I think that is the definition of it. Now, having people over. How? But like it that. only because of the number of people. Right? Well, what number of people make something a business? I don't know. But the, when I say I'm just going by their definitions, it wouldn't really fit well into the bed and breakfast because, like I said, you could only have six people. Six rooms? So, yeah, six, so we could have 12 minutes. Yeah. So, uh, <coughs> getting her. I'd like to see where it says says in a home occupation, or not for home occupation, bed and breakfast. Bed and breakfast shall not provide more than six guest rooms plus a common area. And meals shall be limited to breakfast and evening snack and shall be served only to guests yes. of, the facility, of the facility and members and right. guests of the owner's family. So that's up to, I mean, I think we just. So that would be really good. I, I'm just thinking and like when when you when you when you invite people into your home, those people are your guests. It's a difference in the definition. I'm just disagreeing with the definition of words. I, I think. Sorry. <laughs> I don't. I just I don't, say, I don't think it's you were right. Any closer to the goal? Are we on this page? Sure. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I guess I'm just a little bit confused because my understanding of like the memorandum here is that what the lawyer was saying is that look there's one um, statement for Yellow Spring which is that it's 40 but Ohio has another one that's 115 and what she's specifically asking for is a conditional use in which you guys go by the Ohio code instead of the Yellow Springs code. No, the Yellow, not, it's not, no, it's the other way around. The Yellow Springs code takes precedence. The conditions that are applied to a conditional use are in our zoning code. She's asking for the a condi it's the zone that she's in resident has there are things that are allowed and then there are things that are conditionally allowed. Right. And then the, the conditions that, that those things have to meet to be allowed are set forth in the code. So she's And that's what the forty is. Yeah. So what is a variance? Is, is, is yeah. Well, a variance on a, um, it's a variance on a VZA is, is, is dimensional. Yeah, it's like a dimensional. My fence is too close to the property line. Is that okay? That's a, goes through the board of zoning appeals, and the board of zoning appeals apparently is not. Um, they're they can't change conditional use requirements. The only thing that can change a conditional use requirement is a text amendment, which first starts at the planning commission level, and then it goes on to council. So we could approve this at 40 meals per week, 40 people per week, and also revise, we recommend the council, the council revise the rises of the code, we don't revise it. Until it, to up to 115. Or to some other number. If, if that's what the big census is. Well, can you guys do that? so so could, can but can you? Let, let's time. say you said two hundred. I'm just trying to understand this. So let's say you said two hundred. You can't do that because if that's against. You, the, that, that just means that you have to use that license from the state. You're okay, the so that would be more. I'm just trying to yeah. count that. Yeah. Did you have more questions, sir? Uh, no. I, I have a question, Nora. What you talk about limiting it to one day a week? Yes. What day was that? Tuesday. You keep it Tuesday. Okay. Morning. One morning a week. Yeah, let's be clear on that. It's only yeah. a few hours. Yeah. Which is um, part of the uh, just plan.
playing with the square footage a little bit was why I said it's only a maximum of five hours out of 168 hours in a week. And it goes back to what it was before. It's not like she's not keeping those rooms set aside set for a, that purpose. Right. Because if she was, then that would be, she would be over that number. Right. So by only having it a limited time, then that's not an issue. <coughs> I mean, that's... Which is an interpretation. That's, that's an interpretation. In her favor. In her favor, but I mean, yeah. you know, that has, that's, that's why I said that would be something we'd have to talk about. Yeah, okay. I have a question. Um, sure. And a comment. Why are you... Okay, I, hold up. I don't want to. I'm, I'm sorry. We need to, actually, but if, if you're going to do this, you're going to have to come up and you have to state your name. we got to get this a little bit orderly here. Sorry, Judy. Okay, I, I don't want to get massage therapists in trouble, but why are you turning your back or turn your eyes or head or whatever you do? and say they can do what they do, and that is definitely a business. Norris is a service, it's a community service. And you've heard the testimony of how important it is to a number of people in our community. And to have these picky uni rules that make no sense, that deny something so important happening, is just beyond me that you can't figure out a way to allow something to happen for hours a week. Thank you, please. What's your name? Martha Klein. Thank you. Can, can I comment to that? Yeah. I, I think Denise are, are, are had her plan and so forth. I think she worked with uh, I Nora. can't hear you, Mr. I think, I think she worked with Nora to, to come up with something that she felt would pass through, through planning. Okay, given, given the limitations that she had to work with. And what she came up with was, yes, we would recommend doing it with four. Okay, so I, I think Denise looked through all the options that she had and worked with Nora and that's how we got to the point we are now, okay? and. The, the next step would be, if I understand it, would be for planning to then make a recommendation or, or, or whatever to council to increase it, okay? But to me, let's get the operation going now with what we have and let's work on the future to, to get a raise. But if we want to, work on getting it raised first, looking at council's calendar, uh, we could be two years on this thing, okay? And we're gonna, then you bring in more of the community, the, more of the opposition. <laughs> see, see there's, there's, there's no opposition here, okay? But, but, but as we, we get and start talking about it, then you got residents, on every street in town where the change could affect them, you know, our chances of moving forward aren't that great. So, so I think we're, we're making a big step forward because I've, I've listened to some of the controversy that we ran into why she had to close, okay? But now we're, and, and I don't, based on what I've read, the, the, the recommendation from the staff is to move forward with the 40. So, you know, so that's, that's what I said. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. There's not no Yeah, I mean, in fact, I'm this to the point where I think, I mean, does someone want to um, I, I suggest think, a language for a resolution here? Yeah. Well, I, I guess I'd like to ask Nora because you said initially you couldn't limit it to 40. Would you be willing to limit it to 40? If there's the potential to for it to go up, yes. But, and knowing that's something that we can't guarantee because that's up to the council to make a change and that would be the whole community. But it is, it is that potential. I don't, it doesn't sound to me like I have any choice. May I ask a question? I'm Alice Rovers. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Could Nora um, apply to be a bed and breakfast? Have, you know, at least in, in name, a bed and breakfast, and then be able to serve 115 meals to her friends? I think the way it's written, 
different again yeah. from the summary marks. Yeah. yeah. And this is this will allow you the most people immediately. Why is there a summary block and not like the event? Well, a bunch of other I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm hearing something. What's that? Do you want to say something about that? About what? About the 115? I thought you said something about it's a different exemption or something. It is. It is. Okay, if somebody here wants to yes. speak to that. Yeah, you do it better than I do. Oh. I'm Deborah Leopold from Green County Fine Health District. Um, there's a multitude of exemptions that's in the food code, so I don't want anybody to mix up the exemptions as you go forward. There's one specifically for owner-occupied bed and breakfast. They can serve one meal a day, and that is breakfast only, up to 16 individuals for that day. That's, what's, that's what that exemption would be. The other one is for an owner-occupied resident, it can go up to 115 in a week's period of time. So there's a whole lot of other exemptions, and I don't, so we have to be very clear when council is looking at these, whether it's your number, state code requirements, they're completely different in regards to what everybody's rules and regulations are also exemption, exempting. The other thing that we need to also keep in mind is that when you're opening up to the general public, depending upon the need or how many individuals are coming into that home, there also may be other requirements in regards to building, Green County building regulations, and also your local fire regulations. So I just want to make sure that everybody in this room knows that you have to do all of the regulations. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. That answered my question. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing is, we did hear from the fire department that <laughs> at this point they have really no no comment. So, well, to, to say that more precisely, Matt, is that uh, the, uh, Chief Altman contacted the state fire marshal's office and was advised that that's not a matter where fire marshal would step in under the current circumstances as we're discussing. Okay. To say that that could change. But under the circumstances today. Okay, thanks. Um, any further discussion? Do we want to proceed with a resolution? Uh, well, I'm willing to make a motion. I guess it would be con conditional upon the things that we discuss. That um, no more than 40 could be served at this time, in a week's time, and that the parking would be taken care of through. Um, market and the cornerstone. Cornercone. Corner I'm sorry. <laughs> Cornercone. Um, and that we are looking at the space since it's only um, four hours a week that the she needs the space. Are there any other conditions that need to be there? Does that cover? Do, do we want to address the volunteers? And, that, and that's the other thing, uh, yes, that there, it would be one volunteer. Uh, you can have the family members and one volunteer. Did you capture all that, Judy? Yes. There's one other aspect that I think that bears uh, repeating uh, that uh, Debbie Leopold mentioned, which is to the extent that there's any other uh, inspection or licensure requirements not required by the village. So if there were some state or county, um, there would need to be compliance for that. Right. right. Then add that. Give <laughs> mm -hmm. that right second. It's a second from Sims. Do you want to read what you have? I have the styles is moved to permit the conditional use. Uh, under the following conditions that, that it is limited to 40 um, meals or guests? Meals. Meals. Yes, it's guests under our code. Okay, so guests. Um, per week, um, the parking is accommodated through Tom's and Quarter Cone, but the space is approved given that the use is uh, uh, limited to four hours a week, um, that, that it's limited to one volunteer and family members. Um, and that any state or county regulations must be met. All right. And we have a second. Does that include a day, one day of the week? And that should be a one day a week, right? Limited to put, yep, yeah, on one day per week. Got it. She said Tuesday, but you need to be specific. Right. Don't think so. So does this mean you pass it to council? 
No, no. So, yeah. what are the steps now? Are there further steps where I could go overboard? Well, Should we actually go down this road? Yeah, let's, 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 let's take care of this first. Sorry. Sorry. Do I call the roll? Yes. Sims? Yes. Pelzel? Yes. Stiles? Yes. Toby? Yes. Reed? Yes. <laughs> okay, with that passed unanimously. Um, there is a way, I mean, you have to, there has to be a discussion with council about changing the, the actual language of the code is how that would happen to increase that number. We, but it and, starts at the plan. And it does start here. Yeah, we recommend it. So uh, it doesn't have to start here, but it can for sure. Yeah. But really? it would be probably yeah. good to at least look at um, whether you're going to exempt it to just a certain uh, residential area like RC versus RA and RB. Uh, yeah, that's all part of that conversation. Right, right. I think that it would be it probably the Who Planning Commission to start that dialogue first right. and then move it to well, council. I, didn't just, I would like to, I, I don't know where these records are kept, but you know, to have that conversation, have a list of what um, conditional calm occupations we've already granted over the years and um, where they are and um, to see what that change would affect. Yeah. Well, the other thing is, just think about neighborhoods and everything else, and, and impact. You know how this the uses. So. I okay. Yeah. Um, uh, my name is Tom Knopfler. I, I I wonder. You said it can start here. The changes that might enable Nora to increase the number. They might start here. They can, but they don't have to. The council can initiate but that. So if, if they can. Um, can we get your assurance that they will? I mean, do you have the will to to kind of push this a little bit to, to help Nora out? I, I'm asking you, you know, to ease her mind and, and everyone's mind that, well, that well, you, I will, think, you will go to work on this? I, I think, you know, we need to uh, definitely give our agenda and start plowing for it. And it's not going to happen overnight, but, yeah. but you know. But but we we can definitely put it on the uh, to do list. But we have the sure. will up there to, yeah, sure. to get this done. I mean, at least you know, take a look at it and have people come in and talk to us. And I mean, there's going to be people who don't want that kind of use oh, in their in their neighbors. <laughs> neighbors. <laughs> yeah. And so you know, there's you got to hear from everybody, and and that's not going to happen just you know between now and the end of the year. Right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. So that's it for that other item. Uh, old business, I don't think we have any. So really we're just going to planning. Um, and, and if you folks, um, as you're leaving, if you can avoid having a loud conversation outside the door, otherwise you'll be on television.
And then do we want to put on our agenda? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Begin this conversation. Yeah. So it, I just want to ask, okay, how, how is that done? How do we begin that conversation and, and what is the notification for the community to get the input and everything? Well, I, mean, I think it just has to go in our ad in the paper. Well, it's actually, it's only, if you're contemplating a text amendment, it's got to go in 20 days ahead as a public notice. There, There's further stuff. But that's not for the discussion. That's, that's, that's only when you. Uh, that, if it's going to be your public hearing, then. Yeah. It's, it's, no, that, so it's we're not. And then you've got a position to have. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think yeah. that's where we are. Yeah. We can do that right now. But right I'm right. not so sure that it doesn't, that this wouldn't be a case where they would, Nora would be submitting an application for the text amendment. I'll have to look into that because I, I think there is a form well, for that. I think that's I actually see. a more appropriate route because otherwise it becomes the village submitting for the text amendment and then you put yourself in quite yeah. the pickle if in fact there is a lot of opposition to that. So why yeah. would you say that? Yeah. So so then so, doesn't someone then need to notify Nora to let yeah, you know? I'll, I'll she call her anyway. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but she's going to choose one of the I don't, you know, I don't want to say in stone, but I just am right. saying well, that I thought I saw uh, a per, one of the permits that John had, and I thought one was a text amendment. No, I, I, I'm very confident that Denise will have further conversations with Nora. For example, sure. there's a requirement that a log be maintained. There's other right. things. And I, I, I heard very clearly that Nora wants to make sure that she's following the, the letter of the law. Denise is the zoning administrator. There'll be other discussions. And, uh, and it sounds like the community wants to have a human dialogue on the discussion. And uh, Denise can advise her of that process. And then Nora and her friends and other members of the community can decide the appropriate time to come forward to start that discussion, which can be started through council as well. Right, okay. Okay. Well, with that, is there anything else? If not, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you, everyone.